you have any questions, see me after church. All right, thanks, Tim. Sound like a pretty good deal to me. Where are you gonna go play a round of golf for nine bucks and get fed? <laughs> huh? 90. Oh, 90, okay. <laughs> well, we're trying to sneak up on them, but. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. I thank you for the musicians. It was great music. It, it uh, goes along with the message. And I would say that uh, hopefully by the time You've endured the message. It'll be a positive. God will work in your souls and hearts. Uh, as it says, he works all things for our good. But you have to remember, when he works them for our good, it's good as he understands it. Amen. So he's working it for better good than you can imagine. It's not about how much you got, what your promotions are, your fancy cars. That's not the good he's working for. And we'll talk about that in the, in the conversation here. I better put my eyes on. Ears already don't work very well. Of course, my wife's been telling me that long before I got hearing aids. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to read Romans 8, 28, and if you want to follow along, it's on the back of your notes. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So let me ask a few questions before we start. Do you love those you trust? Have you ever thought of it that way? Do you trust those you love? Now, I have a perspective that I think, I think the ideal is to love those we trust and trust those we love. But I've also recognized in my life that some people should be trusted for who they are. Think about that. I'll give you an example. If I had chickens to guard, I would not hire a fox because I trust him to be a fox, and what do foxes do with chickens? They eat them. So this is not the kind of trust we're talking about. We're not talking about a reserved trust, but a tr true trust. Because if you think about it, if you don't trust the person you love, do you really love them unconditionally? And do they trust you? And I say that because that's a pretty heavy set of questions. You don't have to answer those, by the way. It's up to yourselves. But this is the kind of trust that God is speaking about in this set of verses. And in this whole chapter, chapter 8 is a tremendously powerful chapter in Romans. It's a, the Bible is great all along, but there are places in the Bible that are very more concise and powerful, like Psalm 23, we probably mostly know that, or the Lord's Prayer, or the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Chapter 8 of Romans is another one of those. So in Romans 8, 28 to 30, you could look at this as a promise. If you follow it and respond to it. And we should know and take comfort from it. And I want to say I've had people quote this verse to me at absolutely the wrong time in the wrong way and for the wrong reason. Because... They go to this, God works all things for good. Well, no. He doesn't work things that are like pornography, sex trafficking. He doesn't work those for good. He is working in things that involve his people for their good. And you'll see this. So it's not like the world is magic and all the things that go wrong are really good. It's God working in and through the events in our lives that he uses for the good of conforming us to Christ and to have be like him. So in this verse, if you want to flip back and forth, basically we see that he works well and good, but who is the, who is the all that he's working good for? For those who love him for those who have been called according to his purpose. 
it's not good for you to just write, the, you know, we don't give a blank piece of paper to God and say, just sign here and I'll fill in the details of what's good. Maybe we'd like that. But he is God Almighty, not Genie. Remember the show Genie? Probably before your time, but Aladdin's Lamp. If you've seen the cartoon or the animation. God is not that Genie. He's God Almighty. <clears throat> but this promise tells us that he is always working for those who love him in and through the events of their lives. And so that also means he's always with us. In fact, I thank you, Lord God, that you are even here, right in our midst. We don't have to look to heaven as though you're far away, because you are here. And for all of us who know you in Christ, you are in us as well as with us and in our midst. The Lord Jesus promised us that. We're two or more gathered in his name, and we are gathered in the name of Christ. There he is amongst us. He is also in us by his spirit. I hope you believe that. I hope you rely on that. I hope you're comforted in that in, in, in your greatest sorrows. It doesn't mean the sorrows aren't real. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be sorrowful. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It does all those things. And it, none of, and it doesn't even mean you can't be angry at God. For those who have parents, you love your children, I hope, but I'll believe that you do. I know many of you. But sometimes they get angry at you. And you have to be big enough to deal with it and love them back in spite of their anger, even though they might make you angry. And then they have to love you in spite of your anger. But God is much bigger than all that. He's not insecure. He knows who he is. And so he is always with us, and you can rant at him. And, and if you've ever been in a situation where a little child, or yourself, myself, have lost it in the frustrations of life, and you cry out, why, 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 and it hurts so bad, and you want to beat on his chest, he can just hug you while you're going through that. He doesn't expect you to be able to take everything on he doesn't desire that. He wants you to come to him, even in your sorrow, even in your anguish, even in your failures, knowing that he loves you and all he wants is you run to him because you love him and you know he's there for you. That honors him. I hope you believe that because if you don't, your God is smaller than he really is. It's so when your little kids run up to you when you're young and they're throwing their tantrums, you're bigger than their tantrum, right? You can deal with it. You don't have to be vengeful and say, shut up, sit down. Although I've heard those words on occasion in my younger life. <laughs> so he works for good for those who love him. And when he says, we know, who's the we? The we is all of us who know God. But we forget sometimes. We don't remember or we have a temporary amnesia. And sometimes he needs to remind us and sometimes he uses us in each other's lives to encourage and remind us that he really is there. He really is loving. He really cares. And if you know of the fact that Jesus is fully man and yet fully God. <clears throat> and so as God, of course, he knows everything, right? Yet, if you read the scripture and follow the, the Gospels, Jesus in the flesh had to grow in knowledge and understanding. Because he, if you look at Philippians chapter 2, he set aside being God for the moment while he was still part of the Trinity and lived as a person and grew in knowledge and fa favor with God and man. And the Spirit, he relied on the Spirit if you remember the baptism of Christ, when John baptized him, the baptism of Jesus, the Spirit descended upon him, and then he took him out into the desert for 40 days of temptation. Why I'm saying all this is, I don't think we fully appreciate that, not only does God understand because he's God, he knows things. He understands experientially our sorrow. He understands experientially our pain, because as the man, he fully experienced it. It wasn't just a theoretical understanding because he's God. It was a pragmatic 
experiential understanding as a human being, suffering, being brutalized, being rejected by his family, his brothers. They didn't believe. They actually even said, go, go over there. You might get killed, but do your thing, because they didn't believe. He was rejected by the people he came to and by most humanity. He was tortured. He was abused. He went hungry. He understands all the things that we experience. That's why it says there's no temptation that has taken, to, taken us that is not common to man. And a crisis has learned it. Oh, he's experienced it. He knows it. So we have God who is fully capable of comprehending our sorrows and our pain and to cry with us. To cry with us. So it says it reminds us that God is always with us. And yet, while he's with us, and he's always with us, he's working in, in all things. The things aren't working, he is working in the situation. I know some of you have pain, I know some of you might too. I, maybe physical pain, maybe heart pain, maybe emotional pain, maybe pain of loss. He's with us, he's with you. He knows this pain. And while he doesn't take it away, he will enable you to walk through the pain. Practice business failing, health failing. We look for friends and loved ones to come and walk with us through the pain, through the sorrow, not because they can fix it. Too many of us try to fix somebody else's problem when all they really need is us just to love them and walk with them. And I hope that makes sense to you. Because if it does, then you understand in some degree how God is there. But he goes beyond that because he does use it to help us. To help us to be more gentle, to help us to be more loving, to be more humble, be more dependent on him. And in all these things, he is glorified as we come to him in our frustrations and our anger and our sorrows and our pain. And explain to him, we might even say, I don't understand this. I've been doing all these things. I've been trying. And... How could you let this happen to me? And the reality is, a year or two later, you may look back and realize there are many major things happened in your life and your heart during that time of pain that you didn't, nor couldn't, consciously cause to happen. But God used these things as medicine in raising you up to be a better person and to be more like his son, which should be our ultimate goal as Christians. <clears throat> So it says that uh, he called us in according to his purpose. His purpose. And what was his purpose? Verse 29. For those God foreknew, in other words, before anything, before time, because he's above and beyond time, which is really hard for us to comprehend. He also predestined us he foreknew it. He foreknew who was going to respond, who was going to do what. And so his purpose is for those to come into conformity to his son. Why? That he might, he being Jesus, the Lord, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So those of you who love God and are called according to his purpose and are in Christ are growing to become like our older brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you ask yourself in life, you know, I'm at this point in life when I look back and realize how many things I chased that, that I got, and I wondered why I chased them. <clears throat> the only thing that's worth chasing is knowing Christ better. Everything else, it'll be gone. You can't take it with you. You know, there's a story about a, at a funeral home, the funeral was over and they'd take no, and the young boy asked the funeral director, he says, well, Mr. So-and-so was extremely wealthy. How much did he take with him? He said, none of it. <laughs> he left it all behind. And I think we need to remember that. Not that we shouldn't be earning a living, not that we shouldn't be doing smart things. Maybe God has blessed you in some way that you're a conduit through which he wants to share blessings with many others. We all are. It's just different things we have as gifts in our lives that we have the opportunity to share with others. And as he works in our hearts, we find joy in the sharing. 
So the goal is to be conformed to the image of his son, that, he, that we may be brothers and sisters to who he is, the firstborn among us. And those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So we are to be glorified, yet he say, says it in a past tense. He's already glorified us in Christ, and we're just ripening to full glorification. So God purposes that we become conformed to the image of his Son. And we know the image of the Son is the image of God, right? The image that presents to the physical world God, the nature of God, his goodness, his kindness, his humbleness, all the gifts, 522, the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, generosity, faithfulness. Those are all aspects of who the Lord Jesus Christ is, but in us, the Spirit will bring forth this fruit as we grow and as we are experiencing the different opportunities to recognize where we need to change or where we need to be even better. And not say, I'm going to work harder at that, but ask, Lord, I want to be there. Help me. Enable me to be that kind of person. <clears throat> so he is to be the firstborn among us who are predestined to be his brothers and sisters. The indwelling Holy Spirit should be our source of strength and encouragement and enablement. So, quite a bit there in those three verses. And actually, in the original writings, it's one sentence. But the Greeks wrote these long sentences. You couldn't, you couldn't say the sentence without getting a breath in the middle of it, or maybe several times. So when they translate to English, they kind of try to put it into pieces, into sentences. So it, we capture it the way we think. But in doing it, sometimes we lose the connectivity of how the different portions of it reflect back on it. And I'm hoping that as I've spoken to you, you see that connectivity. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So there's one other question to ask yourself. I'm not quite done yet. Don't think, I'm not going to get off that easy. There's one other question to ask yourself. Is God still actively at work in our world? You know, when we look around, when you watch the news, Pretty depressing sometimes. Seems like the media doesn't think good news sells. So they only bring forth, you know, a hundred negative things for everyone. Uh, that's wonderful. But we still resonate to those wonderful things. But we are, we as people, we who are becoming like him, are to be like him and to be the light and the salt in this difficult time. And yet, we are not able. I ask myself the question, lately especially, you know, when you look at the first century and many centuries over the history of the church, there been a lot of martyrs, a lot of, and the word martyr means witness, by the way. They witnessed with their lives for what they said, and some of the martyrs were more terribly tortured and suffered, Jesus being one on the cross, of course. <clears throat> if that was, if, if that, came to me, that situation, would I, would I stand for Christ, including giving my life, or would I capitulate and renounce him? Now, I don't think any of us can fully know that. It's like if, you, if you've been in the military or any situation where people sacrifice, the people that get recognized sometimes never had it, they never got up in the morning planning to do what they did. They just did it. They did it because it was who they were not what they planned. Paul writes that no one can blaspheme Christ who has the Holy Spirit, but in like manner, no one can truly call Christ Lord without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction and the truth of who we are as he comes into us as we trust 
and seek God's grace for our lives and for our future eternity. So in trying to think of a story that might exemplify this, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are familiar with Joseph, son of Jacob, also a prince of Egypt ultimately. So over on the right side of your notes, I put a bunch of points down there because <clears throat> If you go back and read over that, and you can start at chapter 37 of, of, exit of uh, Genesis and read right through the end. There's a couple chapters in between that are about other brothers, but mostly it's about Joseph and the dynamics of his life. Here's a guy, he was, he was the 11th son, but they, he was a far 11th from the first son. You know, he, there was probably 15, 20 years difference between him and the others. He's 17, well, when he, he had these visions, if you remember the story. He had two visions where the other brothers were bowing down to him. And, and one vision, he also had his parents bowing down. And, and, you know, it was corn shocks, and then it was stars, and sun and the moon. That was sun and the moon with his parents. Of course, that antagonized his brothers. Uh, if you've had a younger brother, they can antagonize, I know. I have one. Um, <laughs> we still love each other, but uh, that made him angry. But then he was kind of Mr. Goody's two-shoes, you know. He, he went out with some of the brothers. Uh, they were, he went and checked with them, and they didn't do what their dad said. And he came back and ratted them out. So he wasn't doing himself any favors. Anyway, long story short, all his brothers were out. The other, ten of the, other, the older brothers, they were all out taking care of the flocks of sheep in a far area. So the father sent Joseph out in this fancy coat that he gave him, which he didn't give anybody else. So, you know, Jacob owned some of this problem. Well, when he got there, he was 17 years old. And the brothers hated him so much that they said, let's kill him. And tell dad that some creature tore him apart. Because there were lions back there and, you know, wild dog backs. And anyway... The oldest brother, Reuben, said, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. Just let's put him in, the, in one of these dry cisterns out here. And so they did. They caught him, 17 years old, and they threw him in the bottom of the cistern. There was no water in it. And he was crying and screaming. And, and uh, one of the other brothers said, you know, if we kill him, he is our brother. We would have our blood, his blood on his hands. But they were in error. There's a, a set of traders going by on the way to Egypt. And he said, why don't we sell him to him? So they sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the traders and took his robe and soaked it in blood and went back and said, do you recognize this, Dad? And he tore his coat because Rachel was, if you remember the story, Jacob married Leah and Rachel. Leah was the older sister, but he wanted Rachel. And Rachel had trouble having children, so Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel after 10 other brothers had already been born. And then Benjamin came later. So it broke his father's heart because Rachel, you know, was his dearest. But anyway, so he goes to Egypt. He's 17 years old. He's sold to the captain of Pharaoh's guards. And God is with him, the Bible says. God is with him. We don't hear anything about Joseph complaining. He's a slave. I guess you don't get to listen to slaves complain. Nobody recorded it. But he works hard for the Pharaoh's captain of the guards. And he winds up that God blesses everything he does. So the guy puts two and two together. You know, things weren't going so well. We got Joseph. Everything's going really good. We're going to put him in charge. He's got the gift of doing things. And maybe gift of administration or something. Anyway, now Pharaoh had a wife. And Joseph was probably in his early mid-20s. And he was a good-looking boy. And his wife thought, yeah, he's really hot. And, uh, you know... I'm not so bad myself, should be not a problem. Well, so she goes to Joseph and said, come lay with me. And she didn't mean sleep. And uh, he said, no. And so this goes on, goes on, goes on. And then Potiphar, who's the, the head of the house, he goes away for some business. And she continues to ring him. So he keeps saying no. And he gets in the house and she grabs him by his clothes. And he basically says, no, I can't do this. It would be... Uh, how can I do this? Your husband has trusted me with everything he owns except you and his, himself. How can I do this and, and sin before God who has been so good to me? And he runs. 
naked because she doesn't let go of his clothes. And of course, they didn't have buttons and zippers back then. They, you know, you know, talk about running out of your clothes to get away from danger. Anyway, so she keeps the clothes because now she's really angry. You know what they say about a woman scorned? Definitely Potiphar's wife. And she says, that Hebrew slave has tried to have his way with me, but fortunately I fended him off and screamed and he ran away. Here's his clothes. So they throw him in prison, in a pharaoh's prison. Now he's in prison a couple years, but everything goes well, so the warden says, you know, you should run everything. You're doing a great job. So he's running the prison. Same side, God is with him. Two guys from the, the close inward supporters of the king, of the pharaoh, One's the baker for the king, one's the cupbearer who basically squeezes the grapes in the juice or puts the wine in the cup, makes sure it's not poisoned because he has to taste it. They've been put in there because Pharaoh wasn't happy with him on his birthday. Anyway, they both have dreams and they are depressed and they tell Joseph the dream. He said, well, God knows the answer to this, so he tells them the, the one dream is that the, one, the cup bearer is going to be restored to his position before the pharaoh, and the other is the baker. He's not going to make it. He's going to get put on a pike and have his head cut off. Not good dreams. If you, one guy got, was really happy, the second dream interpretation, not so much. And it comes true. But the cup bearer forgets about Joseph, even though he said, I'll, think, I'll remember you if I get restored. So Joseph is in prison another two years. Pharaoh has this huge dream. I don't know how many of you remember the story because I'm going in detail, but I kind of laid it out here. He basically, <clears throat> Pharaoh has dreamed this dream that there were seven fat cows and they went down to the river and then seven skinny cows came out of the river and ate the fat cows and they were still skinny. And the other part of the dream was there were seven rich stalks of corn with big ears, not these kind. <clears throat> And then there were scorched corn who looked like it was hardly surviving who ate the big ears of corn. And so Joseph says, well, God can answer dreams, can, can explain dreams. So he thinks and he says, God has revealed to you what is about to happen, Pharaoh. And because we feel the same type of dream to you twice, he's certain he's going to do it. So the first one is the cows. There's going to be seven years of great overabundance of crops, and then the skinny cows that ate up all the fat cows, seven years of terrible famine, and the same for the corn. And so Pharaoh says, what do we do? And so he says, well, you need to take from all the grains that are had, take 20% of all the, first taxes, right? Take 20% of all that's harvested and put in stockpile for the years of famine. And so they did that. And they had the superabundance of 20% of superabundance is a big number. And then the famine comes after the seven years of abundance. So two years into the famine, the whole area, way up to where jo Jacob and the family live in, are all in this famine and they're starving. So people are coming to Egypt to buy grain. And Joseph's brothers come down because Jacob sends them down to buy grain. But they don't bring the youngest brother, which is Joseph's full brother, Benjamin, because they're all half-brothers because they have the same father, but they have several different mothers. Joseph recognized him, but he's been raised to be in charge of everything, so he's second to Pharaoh, just like he was second to Potiphar. Only Pharaoh gave him a wife, uh, not one of his. And so Joseph recognizes him. And he, they don't recognize him because they're in awe of him and they're terrified. And so he messes with him a little bit, and he sells him the grain, and he says, you guys are spies, you need to, one of you is to stay here until you bring the younger brother back as a proof that you're telling me the truth. And they say, no, we can't do that, our father would die after the young one, he's already lost the one he favored. And they're talking to each other in Hebrew, of course Joseph understands Hebrew, but he only speaks to him through an interpreter, so they don't know he's listening in. Long story, they go back to Jacob, they leave uh, Simeon behind, and they go back, and Jacob is grateful for the food, but they find out that all the money they get paid for the grain, somebody put it back in their sacks with the grain. So now they're like really scared because 
You're going to think we robbed them and took the grain. Took the grain and kept the money. I can't go back. And such as we can't go back without Benjamin. Jacob says, Benjamin can't go down. If Benjamin goes down and he doesn't come back, I'll go to my grave in tremendous sorrow. I've, always, I've already lost Joseph, and now Simeon is gone. Anyway, they're starting to starve again, and so they go back down. They go back down, and they come in with Benjamin, and Joseph looks at them all. They let Simeon come out. They ask about uh, the man, the people's father, Jacob. Yes, he's alive. The, Long story short, and you can read it, they, he reveals who he is to them. Now, I mean, think about it with you. The guy that, when he was 17, who's now 30, and he's the second in command to Pharaoh, who isn't necessarily a nice guy to people who doesn't like, remember the baker? Now this guy, who I sold into slavery, is the guy with my life in his hands. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little bit worried. And Joseph doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He treats them well, and then Pharaoh finds out that these are his brothers. And he, of course, what he does before he reveals himself, he has dinner with them. He, sets the, he has the table set in the order of who they are at, by age. And he said, how does he know this stuff? You know, this guy can, he said, it must be divination or whatever. And then he sends food to them, but he sends Benjamin five times as much as everybody else. <laughs> and then he reveals himself. And uh, so then they, Pharaoh says, bring your parents and your family all down here. So that's how Israel winds up in Egypt long before Exodus is written in Moses. But my point in telling that story is, in chapter 50 of Genesis, Jacob comes down, he lives with them for many years, they grow in family, and he dies. And now the brothers are worried because they're afraid now that Jacob's gone, Joseph is going to whack him. And they come before him and they, they make up a story, you know, Dad said that you should take care of us. And he said, and he writes, and I got it at the bottom of the notes there. He says, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? You intended for harm to me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And the only answer I can say to how did Joseph get from this 17-year-old who spent 13 years of a prisoner and a slave, and then, by God's good grace, became the second to Pharaoh. As Joseph was working all that time, he was learning things, he was being changed. He went from the kid who was spoiled with this coat of many colors, if you, you, know, you listen to the musical, to this wise person, yet humble, who could get past the past, but because God is with him. Now, hopefully you see how this is similar to what God is promising to us in 8, 28 through 30, that he is a work for good. Do you think all that time Joseph thought it was good that he was sold in a slave? It was good that Potiphar's wife kept chasing him? He was building character or confirming his character or strengthening it by saying no, even when it meant he's going to be thrown in the prison? No. Let me see. Even thrown in prison or have relations with this beautiful woman. It's like saying, do I want ice cream or broccoli? <laughs> you know, probably many of you would take broccoli, but I, I probably would, I, I, I lean towards ice cream. I hope you see that, and I hope that the promise or the truth of 28 and 29 You'll take that to heart, and, and when you're going through the very hard things, look to him to do what is best, and not try to tell him what is best. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. It's hard. But he loves us. He loves you. And we, your brothers and sisters, we love each other, and we should, and increasingly we should, and be there for each other because that's part of how God's love is shown and expressed. That's why the Lord said, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
No longer love your neighbor as yourself. Go beyond that. Love him as Jesus has loved him. And what did he do? He gave us life for us. So, the last one I'll mention is, I'll read on the back of the page there, top verse, remind us that God is still God. For the Lord your God is God of gods, in other words, of all the lesser beings. Lord of all lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He's still at work. And for those who love him and are cooperative, he works in our lives. But if we're not cooperative and we're in this family already, he's still going to work in your life. But it's a lot more fun to work with him than it is to fight him. So please think about who you love and do you trust them. But really I say that because if you say you trust God, then you must love him. Because my view is how could you not... I'm not talking romantic, emotional love, although I am emotional about some of those things. How could you say you trust him if you don't love him and don't believe he loves you? Because the people we love the most, we want to do the best for and have done the best for us and have been models and examples for us. So I love you, my brothers and sisters, and I hope you will let God bless you as this set of verses and help each other as we go through life in this difficult times we're in. By the way, they were just as difficult under the Romans. It's not like this is a brand new world of, of wonderful people that are really being good in their leadership. Everybody seems to want power and money and fame, but we're not supposed to be chasing those things. We're supposed to be wanting to be like Christ and loving one another and others. So God bless you. I'll close with a prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God. We thank you for your great goodness and mercy, your kindness, your consistency, your holiness, which we don't even comprehend. Please open our hearts and minds that you might work in them. Draw us ever closer to the Lord Jesus that we might be more like him and glorify him as you glorify him through us. Now send us home with your blessing. Make your face to shine upon us. Let us lift our confidence and look at you with joy and admiration and with love. For we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Thank you.